Welcome everyone, my name is Dan, and in this video I will be covering how to create a shared cloud development server and add some new users so you can collaborate. The first thing we want to do is uh, go to our cloud provider. In this case, I'm going to be using DigitalOcean. I've chosen them because they have low cost, simple billing, and they are a great provider to create a simple machine for about $6 a month that you can use to develop stuff yourself um, or collaborate with a couple other people. So once you have your account and you go here, you can click get started with a droplet, or you can go to the create dropdown menu and choose droplets. In this case, I'm going to choose an Ubuntu Linux distribution. This is using 22.10, um, but you can choose previous versions. Okay, I'm actually going to choose 2204, the long-term service version. I tend to prefer those. We will choose a regular CPU plan with for $6 a month. This is going to give us a gigabyte of memory and a shared CPU um, and uh, an okay sized SSD for making simple programs or running uh, prototype servers. We come down here to authentication. I'm going to choose to create a password. Uh, if you would like, you can also use the SSH keys. Uh, we'll be adding um, SSH keys later. Uh, so we'll have, in effect, the same uh, security. Once you've chosen your password, you can come down here and click Create Droplet. It'll begin building, and in a few minutes, your server will be ready to log in. Once your server is up and running, you'll need to copy your IP address and open the terminal. Log in to your remote machine as root user with the IP address given. We'll say yes to the fingerprinting, enter your password, and then you'll be logged in as the root user on your remote server. So we don't want to be uh, always logging in as our root user and installing things as the root user. So we'll go ahead and create two users, one for ourselves and one for someone we're sharing the development server with so we can both securely log in and access the shared environment. Since we're already logged in as the root user, uh, we can directly use the user add command. Uh, we're going to set the default shell for our user. We're gonna use the dash M flag uh, to give us a home directory. And we can add ourselves to specific groups. Uh, for instance, the Docker group, if Docker is installed. So in this example, I don't have Docker installed. Um, one of the things you could do is from the DigitalOcean instance selection, you can choose to have a Docker-based image instead of a plain uh, Ubuntu 2204. So once our user is created, you can switch user to Dan. Uh, you can check that we are in our home directory. So if you logged in uh, or switched user to the one you just created, what you can do is type exit and get back to the root user. From here, what we want to do is also check if uh, our user was created and it looks like it is. We're going to set up the user we just created for ourselves as a passwordless pseudo user to make it a little easier to develop and work on this machine. What we're going to do is uh, run the echo command and insert this string um, into a new file in the etc sudoers.d directory. This file will have the same name as our user. And then we will continue and execute another command, which changes the permissions uh, for the user and group uh, that this file is readable only. Looks like I had a little extra space there. And if we check our uh, etc sudoers d directory, we'll see that we now have a file with our username. And if we check the contents of that file, it looks like it's formatted correctly. So what this is going to do is for our username, we're going to give permissions um, for everything, so to, to access everything that has root user privileges and we're gonna require no password. For the shared user account, we're gonna perform a similar set of steps. Something we can do to make this a little easier is to export an environment variable with the new username. And then we can reference that environment variable in the subsequent commands. For this user, we're not going to add them as a passwordless pseudo user. However, you can do that if you would like. If we check the contents of the home directory, we can see that both users are created. For this next part, we wanna add an SSH key pair both of our users so we can log in securely. I'm going to switch over to my user account and create a .ssh folder. And within that folder, I'm going to make an authorized keys file. We're going to open that authorized keys file with a, well, a text editor of our choice. You can use Vim or Nano. One of the resources I like to use uh, when looking up how to create SSH key pairs is to go to the academy at ssh.com. They have a good article on different algorithms, common syntax to create these commands. In this case, I am going to use this ED25519 algorithm. So 
on your local machine, go ahead and run the key gen. Go ahead and give the file a name. In this case, I'm not going to give the key itself a passphrase. And you'll, you should see this screen that shows the key was successfully generated. And we can see in our SSH directory that we created both a private key and a public key. Uh, so now what you'll want to do is you'll want to look at the contents of the public key. And then we can copy over the contents of this public key into our authorized key file from the server. Once you got that public key over there, Go ahead and save and exit the file. Now, if I log out of my session with the uh, sudo user and I log out of the root session from my home PC, my local PC, I, could, I should be able to SSH in as the newly created user at that machine. But I need to use dash I and pass it the path to this private key file that we just created. And we were able to successfully log in. Now for the other user account, what you could do is have the other developer send you the public key. But in this example, I will go ahead and create another key pair and add it to an authorized key file in their user directory. Let's see if we can go ahead and log back in as the root. So since this user account has pseudo privileges, we can log in as our other user. And this is so when we create the authorized key file, it'll have permissions for this user. So let's go ahead and make the SSH directory. We can change into the SSH directory and then create an authorized keys file. We can open up that authorized keys file in our editor. And then let's go ahead and create another key pair on our local machine. Let's go ahead and name this SSH uh, key pair something else so that we can distinguish it from the one we created before. Again, no password for the key itself. Okay, and once again, we need to get the public uh, key. We can copy this and then from our other terminal, we can paste in the public key into the authorized key file. Go ahead and save and quit. Let's log out of our remote server, and then let's test if the login works with this new key pair. Go ahead and say yes to the fingerprint. All right, and let's go ahead and see if this new key pair works. Okay, that was interesting. Uh, I actually ran into a little bit of a problem uh, trying to get the login with the Linda user working. What was happening is it was prompting me for Linda's password, which she doesn't have. So what I had to do was basically log in as her. So I went into the Dan account, which has pseudo privileges, did the sudo su dash Linda, and then went into the SSH directory, removed the authorized keys file, recreated it, checked if it was there, saw that it had a, some permissions that uh, we don't really want. And then what we can do is we can so we're as the Linda user, we're going to change the permissions of the authorized key file. Only the owner, Linda, has read and write permissions. So this six number corresponds to four for the read permission and then plus two for the write permission. So four plus two is six, right? So that's what you get that six number for. And then zero for the group, which would be the next three of those numbers and then zero for everyone else, which is the next three of those numbers. And so once this was done, uh, I was able to log out of Linda. I was able to log out of the privileged user, Dan in this case. And then once I'm back on my home, I'm able to run this command once again. I can SSH in as Linda to the IP address and then provide it the correct uh, private key. So what you need to do now though, is you would need to give this private key to the developer you're sharing the machine with and potentially encourage them to change the key. Now, it, it doesn't make too much sense in this case that you have it because you created a privileged user that can access their um, system anyway. In general, you want to be aware of that, that, uh, that more than one person has access to this private key. Okay, so what we can do now is log back out. We're back here in the on our local machine. And now we want to make it a little easier to log in and out without having to type the entire IP address each time or write the path to the private key file. And so what you can do here is in your machine's SSH directory, we have what's called a config file. And I have several configs already here. But basically what I want to do is uh, write a new one so I can just type a simple SSH in the name of the machine and then it'll automatically log me in. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Okay, so in this file, uh, what you can do is you can have the host directive. This is gonna be the name that you type in. Uh, the host name in this case is gonna be an IP address. If you have a domain assigned to your machine, you can use, oops, you can use the domain instead of the IP address, the name of the user, and in this case, the path to 
the private SSH key as we demonstrated before. And so once this is set up uh, from your terminal, you can just type in SSH and then the name of the name that you gave it in the line 31 over there on the right. And then it's basically saved the IP username and identity file information. So now you can quickly do that. And so you can suggest this to your developer partner as a way to set up their machine as well. The next thing I wanna show you is now that we've set up the SSH credentials on the remote machine, we can utilize the VS Code to easily develop on the remote machine. What you'll need is this extension called Remote SSH from Microsoft. It's actually included in this extension bundle called Remote Development. So this will include both the Remote SSH extension and the Dev Containers extension, which I also find very useful for developing remotely uh, in VS Code. With that extension installed, uh, you can open up the command palette with Control Shift P, and you can do remote as SSH, and then you can connect to host. What you'll see is the name. You, so these other ones were uh, items that I already have, other remote hosts. In this case, you see DigitalOcean, which we created earlier. It'll open up a new window. We can actually uh, expand this or for the moment, we'll just pick the platform. So we picked a Linux platform. It's going to install the VS Code server on the remote machine. So that's the back end portion of VS Code. The front end, the UI will still be running on our local machine. Looks like this is connected. So I'm gonna go ahead and expand this window. You can see in the bottom right, we are editing on SSH DigitalOcean. We can click open folder. So this is gonna be on the file system on the remote machine on the remote machine, home Dan, you can see that there is, uh, it added a .vs code server folder. This will contain files and extensions that VS code needs to run on the backend. So you won't be able to create a new folder directly from here. So what we can do is we can exit out of this. We can open up a terminal. Now this terminal will be on the remote machine as our user. We can then make a new directory for example, example, we can close that. We can then open this folder. We see example is here, and this will now open this folder as a VS Code project. We can trust the owners of all files in the parent folder, uh, or we can just trust the authors in this particular folder. It's our user folder. So the advantage of this is that both you and in my, like Linda, the other user in this example, have uh, isolated development environments, but we can also share the resources that are on the system. So if you installed Node.js or Go or Python at the system level, you would have access to these resources with the same versions. However, you also have a, an environment that can be isolated from each other. So if we open the terminal again, we can see we're in the example folder in our home directory, and we can create new files. Or in this example, I created index.html. If I want to, I can insert a boilerplate snippet for HTML. Let's give it a some text that's different from the boilerplate. And then let's see if we can open it up in the preview. Looks like I might need to install the live preview extension. So the live preview extension uh, from Microsoft, it lets you do like live previews of HTML files. This was already installed in my local system, but since we're developing remotely, it needs permission or it needs explicit installation on the remote machine. So I can just click install on the DigitalOcean machine. Once that's completed, I can close this and I can click show preview. And now I can preview the web page that is stored and running and being developed on the remote machine. And if we were to close out our VS Code windows and open up a fresh one, uh, we will see in our recent folders or our recent projects that our example project that we SSH into on DigitalOcean uh, is right there. So we can easily jump back into this remote development environment. There you go. Once it connects, everything's back exactly as it was and you're ready to go. If you made it this far on one of these early videos, I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope you have a fantastic day and I'll see you in the next one.